I am firmly convinced that the accumulated brains and determination of this commission and of the scientific community of the world will, before the end of this decade, come forward with some answers and cures that we need so very much. With these unvarnished words, Lyndon Johnson told his Commission on Heart Disease, Cancer and Stroke to get to work. It was April 17, 1964. And you have among you uh, some of the great doctors, some of the great public servants of our time. And somehow, some way, sometime, you're going to find the answers. And I hope it will be soon. The economy was booming, and medical knowledge was burgeoning. But many Americans were aware of a gap in the benefits of medicine, medical knowledge, a gap between what was possible and what was widely available. The gap existed between, let's say, where the centers were doing this work, and out in the periphery, doctors in practice, not picking up patients who had these diseases and referring them for operation, you see? So there was a, a, a gap in the knowledge available to treat patients. Johnson asked DeBakey to chair a presidential commission which he hoped would come up with a plan to restructure the American practice of medicine in order to combat the three major killers. The report was delivered in December 1964 in time for the January State of the Union message. It contained 35 specific recommendations for changes in the delivery of medical care in the United States. But the concerted drive on the three killer diseases had to take a detour through the political process. The Congress reacted and they cut out any approval for the building of facilities to calm down the concerns that people were going to be sent away. They made the program a cooperative program where it was not something that someone can come in and direct. The legislation creating the regional medical programs was signed into life in October 1965. Its goal is simple to speed the miracles of medical research from the laboratory to the bedside. So the regional medical programs was created and permitted money to flow to entities that were not geographic or political jurisdictions. They were watershed jurisdictions. I thought that was an incredible breakthrough for the federal government to take as a step. There was an effort, for instance, out of the Missouri RMP, one of the, one of the first operational uh, RMPs that, uh, that uh, set up a a uh, communication link between a group of physicians, uh, cardiologists in Springfield, Missouri, and the medical center in Columbia that uh, would permit uh, the, uh, the remote uh, reading of, of EKGs. Uh, again, a kind of capacity that's now routine in medical care. I thought, uh, to me, the, uh, I don't know if it's exciting, but important, the most important thing that, that RMP did was to put in place, uh, which is still in place in the United States, the intensive care units for heart disease patients, the coronary care units, and the training of personnel for that, and the specialized equipment for that. That probably was its greatest technical contribution to patient care. RMPs not only spurred development of remote EKG readings and coronary care units, but also made rapid strides in vascular surgery and in the development of regional trauma centers. Although the regional medical programs had received their highest level of funding ever in fiscal year 1973, they had been completely cut out of the budget for 1974 and the director of regional medical programs was ordering them to begin shutting down. What happened? Part of the answer to that question is that the times had changed. The Vietnam War had raised the issue of guns and butter and uh, uh, funds suddenly became very restricted at the federal level. 
And then finally, I think regional medical programs as a part of the Great Society programs was caught up in, in a rejection of, of such programs. Casper Weinberger, as head of the Office of Management and Budget, had been one of the RMP's harshest critics. When Weinberger was appointed Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare by President Nixon in 1972, his attitude toward the RMPs could hardly be expected to change, and it didn't. When Congress wanted to extend the life of the RMPs for another year, HEW Secretary Weinberger lobbied against it. The Congress voted overwhelmingly to extend the life of regional medical programs. The Nixon administration impounded the funds, a dubious legal expedient. That was something the regional medical programs thought Secretary Weinberger had no right to do since Congress had clearly appropriated the money to be spent by the RMPs. So the National Association of Regional Medical Programs sued to have the money released sued and ultimately won. On February 7, 1974, the court ordered the money released. Reluctantly, the White House complied. I think we had the right concept, but we didn't understand the culture. I think that now that we have a quarter of a century under our belt since regional medical programs, that um, all we've got to get is to Congress to enact them all over again, and this time around, <laughs> we'll do a better job. The regional medical programs accomplished only part of what they set out to do, and it may be that they were simply ahead of their time. But many of the ideas behind them have endured, and it may be that somehow, some way, sometime, they will provide the blueprint for the future of American medicine.